This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cory Samuel. The Consolation of Philosophy by Anicius Manlius Severinus Boethius. Translated by H. R. James. Book 4 Good and Ill Fortune. Section 4 and Song 4 the unreasonableness of hatred. Then said I, This is very true. I see that the vicious, though they keep the outward form of man, are rightly said to be changed into beasts in respect of their spiritual nature. But, inasmuch as their cruel and polluted minds vent their rage in the destruction of the good, I would this license were not permitted to them. Nor is it, said she, I shall be shown in the fitting place. Yet, if that license which thou believest to be permitted to them were taken away, the punishment of the wicked would be in great part remitted. For verily, incredible as it may seem to some, it needs must be that the bad are more unfortunate when they have accomplished their desires than if they are unable to get them fulfilled. If it is wretched to will evil, to have been able to accomplish evil is more wretched, for without the power the wretched will would fail of effect. Accordingly, those whom thou seest to will, to be able to accomplish, and to accomplish crime, must needs be the victims of a threefold wretchedness, since each one of these states has its own measure of wretchedness. Yes, said I, yet I earnestly wish they might speedily be quit of this misfortune by losing the ability to accomplish crime. They will lose it, said she, sooner than perchance thou wishest, or they themselves think likely, since verily, within the narrow bounds of our brief life, there is nothing so late in coming that any one, least of all an immortal spirit, should deem it long to wait for. Their great expectations, the lofty fabric of their crimes is oft overthrown by a sudden and unlooked-for ending, and this but sets a limit to their misery. For if wickedness makes men wretched, he is necessarily more wretched who is wicked for a longer time, and were it not that death, at all events, puts an end to the evil doings of the wicked, I should account them wretched to the last degree. Indeed, if we have formed true conclusions about the ill fortune of wickedness, that wretchedness is plainly infinite, which is doomed to be eternal. Then said I, a wonderful inference, and difficult to grant, but I see that it agrees entirely with our previous conclusions. Thou art right, said she, but if any one finds it hard to admit the conclusion, he ought in fairness either to prove some falsity in the premises, or to show that the combination of propositions does not adequately enforce the necessity of the conclusion. Otherwise, if the premises be granted, nothing whatever can be said against the inference of the conclusion. And here is another statement which seems not less wonderful, but on the premises assumed is equally necessary. What is that? The wicked are happier in undergoing punishment than if no penalty of justice chasten them. And I am not now meaning what might occur to any one, that bad character is amended by retribution, and is brought into the right path by the terror of punishment, or that it serves as an example to warn others to avoid transgression. But I believe that in another way the wicked are more unfortunate when they go unpunished even though no account be taken of amendment, and no regard be paid to example. Why, what other way is there beside these? said I. Then said she, Have we not agreed that the good are happy, and the evil wretched? Yes, said I. Now if, said she, to one in affliction there be given along with his misery some good thing, is he not happier than one whose misery is misery pure and simple, without admixture of any good? It would seem so. 
But if to one thus wretched, one destitute of all good, some further evil be added, besides those which make him wretched, is he not to be judged far more unhappy than he whose ill fortune is alleviated by some share of good? It could scarcely be otherwise. Surely, then, the wicked, when they are punished, have a good thing added to them, to wit the punishment which by the law of justice is good, and likewise, when they escape punishment, a new evil attaches to them in that very freedom from punishment which thou hast rightly acknowledged to be an evil in the case of the unrighteous. I cannot deny it. Then the wicked are far more unhappy when indulged with an unjust freedom from punishment than when punished by a just retribution. Now it is manifest that it is just for the wicked to be punished, and for them to escape unpunished is unjust. Why, who would venture to deny it? This too, no one can possibly deny, that all which is just is good, and conversely, all which is unjust is bad. Then I answered, These inferences do indeed follow from what we lately concluded, but tell me, said I, dost thou take no account of the punishment of the soul after the death of the body? Nay, truly, said she, great are these penalties, some of them inflicted, I imagine, in the severity of retribution, others in the mercy of purification. But it is not my present purpose to speak of these. So far my aim hath been to make thee recognize that the power of the bad which shocked thee so exceedingly is no power, to make thee see that those of whose freedom from punishment thou didst complain are never without the proper penalties of their unrighteousness, to teach thee that the license which thou praidst might soon come to an end is not long enduring, that it would be more unhappy if it lasted longer, most unhappy of all if it lasted for ever, Thereafter, that the unrighteous are more wretched if unjustly let go without punishment, than if punished by a just retribution. From which point of view it follows, that the wicked are afflicted with more severe penalties, just when they are supposed to escape punishment. Then said I, While I follow thy reasonings, I am deeply impressed with their truth. But if I turn to the common convictions of men, I find few, who will even listen to such arguments, let alone admit them to be credible. True, said she, they cannot lift eyes accustomed to darkness to the light of clear truth, and are like those birds, whose vision night illumines and day blinds, for while they regard, not the order of the universe, but their own dispositions of mind, they think the license to commit crime, and the escape from punishment, to be fortunate. But mark the ordinance of eternal law. Hast thou fashioned thy soul to the likeness of the better, thou hast no need of a judge to award the prize. By thine own act hast thou raised thyself in the scale of excellence. Hast thou perverted thy affections to baser things, look not for punishment from one without thee. Thine own act hath degraded thee, and thrust thee down. Even so, if alternately thou turn thy gaze upon the vile earth, and upon the heavens, though all without thee stand still, by the mere laws of sight, thou seemest now sunk in the mire, now soaring among the stars. But the common herd regards not these things. What then? Shall we go over to those whom we have shown to be like brute beasts? Why, suppose now one who had quite lost his sight should likewise forget that he had ever possessed the faculty of vision, and should imagine that nothing was wanting in him to human perfection, should we deem those who saw as well as ever blind? Why, they will not even assent to this either, that they who do wrong are more wretched than those who suffer wrong, though the proof of this rests on grounds of reason no less strong. Let me hear these same reasons said I. Wouldst thou deny that every wicked man deserves punishment? I would not, certainly. 
and that those who are wicked are unhappy is clear in manifold ways. Yes, I replied. Thou dost not doubt, then, that those who deserve punishment are wretched. Agreed, said I. So then, if thou wert sitting in judgment, on whom wouldst thou decree the infliction of punishment? On him who had done the wrong, or on him who had suffered it? Without doubt, I would compensate the sufferer at the cost of the doer of the wrong. Then, the injurer would seem more wretched than the injured. Yes, it follows. And so for this and other reasons resting on the same ground, inasmuch as baseness of its own nature makes men wretched, it is plain that a wrong involves the misery of the doer, not of the sufferer. And yet, says she, the practice of the law courts is just the opposite. Advocates try to arouse the commiseration of the judges for those who have endured some grievous and cruel wrong, whereas pity is rather due to the criminal, who ought to be brought to the judgment seat by his accusers in a spirit not of anger but of compassion and kindness, as a sick man to the physician, to have the ulcer of his fault cut away by punishment, whereby the business of the advocate would either wholly come to a standstill, or, did men prefer to make it serviceable to mankind, would be restricted to the practice of accusation. The wicked themselves also, if through some chink or cranny they were permitted to behold the virtue they have forsaken, and were to see that by the pains of punishment they would rid themselves of the uncleanness of their vices, and win in exchange the recompense of righteousness, they would no longer think these sufferings pains. They would refuse the help of advocates, and would commit themselves wholly into the hands of their accusers and judges. Whence it comes to pass, that for the wise no place is left for hatred, only the most foolish would hate the good, and to hate the bad is unreasonable. For if vicious propensity is, as it were, a disease of the soul like bodily sickness, even as we account the sick in body by no means deserving of hate, but rather of pity, so, and much more, should they be pitied, whose minds are assailed by wickedness, which is more frightful than any sickness. Song 4 the unreasonableness of hatred. Why all this furious strife? Oh, why, with rash and wilful hand, provoke death's destined day? If death ye seek, lo, death is nigh. Not of their masters will those courses swift delay. The wild beasts vent on man their rage. Yet gainst their brothers' lives, men point the murderous steel unjust and cruel wars they wage, and haste with flying darts the death to meet or deal. No right nor reason can they show, tis but because their lands and laws are not the same. Wouldst thou give each his due? Then know the love the good must have, the bad thy pity claim. End of Book 4 Good and Ill Fortune Section 4 and Song 4 The Unreasonableness of Hatred